It's Wednesday, Wednesday evening again, the last Wednesday of the month of October. And Eamon McFadden is with me, myself, John Mackett here. And uh, we have an extra we have an extra hour this weekend, Eamon, in bed. Whatever we'll do with that. Are we any extra news to report to because of that extra hour, do you think? Time changes. There, there probably won't be, actually. <laughs> but we'll be looking at the COP conference that begins at the weekend in, in Glasgow and for the environment this is meant to be the this is a UN environmental project that's been going mm. on for I think this is the 26th AGM um, they're going to try and get as many heads together as 20,000 people you to attend it despite the fact that Glasgow City has only 11,000 hotel beds uh, the accord that they came to in Paris in 2015 would envisage that the temperature wouldn't rise more than 1.5 degrees Celsius Mm, we're probably very close to that at the moment mm. but notably the main countries the main polluters like China Brazil Mexico Russia Japan are amongst those who are not attending uh, but are we in the last chance saloon is global warming going to damage this earth to an extent that, that it won't be recoverable mm. that is a strange possibility and at the same time we're very concerned about it here in Ireland given that with a population of 5 million people, you know, I'd imagine that if we manage to package the 5 million and get them on board a, a rocket to Venus or somewhere for a year, the world might not notice for a long time that we had actually gone. Because we our, our impact, let it be global warming or let it be population-wise, is so minimal. But that is uh, coming up this weekend, and we'll watch that with interest to see what exactly does come out of it. And are the threats going to be as severe or are they going to be worse than we, than we have imagined? Now, given that there are so many pe people coming to it, it's, 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 it's not really 200,000 people coming over the two weeks. But we're going to move on. We'll take a quick look at COVID because numbers are on the rise again All this right. week. I'm getting away from it. Mm, over 500 people in hospital yesterday and today for the first time since last March. All the indicators are all going the wrong way. And it remains to be seen how soon can we turn that back. I think it's going to get it's going to get worse in the shorter term for sure. They're hoping that in the next two weeks, it'll turn around to some extent and begin to go the other way. Uh, I don't know what the evidence is. Where is there any evidence based uh, uh, stories about how that's going to happen, or is it just a hope more than an ambition? You know, is there any scientific knowledge to suggest that it's going to? Going to reverse itself because they have to just watch the previous trends now at this stage, you know. They, they but they, they weren't dealing with the same variants in the past, you know. So, the, the, that's but, the data they're working off. But given that we opened up the nightclubs and there's a big debate around that, were we right to do so? Should we have opened them earlier or should we not have opened them at all? That's a debate we'll know in the next couple of weeks how this thing transfers itself, yeah. Uh, or does it become a relevant factor in the, uh, right across that whole sector of that, that nighttime society, mm. you know. Uh, I would have I would have an open mind about that, but the idea of a meaningful Christmas, you know, Christmas Day is just eight weeks away from Saturday. Yeah. So we're we're counting down the clock. Yeah. But we're going to move on from that. We're going to look at a story that you have done, where you're suggesting that Fanon is a slice of heaven for Anna. Anna, yeah. Funny, it's a, it's a fire cry from all that what we're just chatting about, because I had the pleasure of chatting with uh, Anna Marcus, who's a. a originally from Germany, near uh, between Dortmund and Hanover. And it was very refreshing to chat her because when we see places like our own home areas, you know, we kind of just see them for what we, we see them day in, day out. Mm -hmm. But Anna completely fell in love with the place when she started to visit there a number of years ago. And she kind of recounted the story of how she ended up by chance taking a, a booking a, a cottage up near Marine Hill, not knowing having a clue where she was headed for. And she arrived up from when she lived in Belfast at that time. She found herself uh, pulled into a wee small traditional Irish cottage and she didn't have a clue what it would look like or what the surroundings were like until she woke up the next day and she saw the view of Ballyheeran Bay and all the vista of the greater Fanard area up in Fanard Head. And uh, she just had a lot of nice things to say about the place, you know. She uh, And she has kept coming back, I kept, believe. Uh, she's, yeah. She comes back now. She's back, she was back again last week and that's when we had the chance to chat even, her. Even despite the COVID, she's been managed to get... Uh, she was to, her first to opportunity she had to come. But... She, she's a great uh, fan of the place. She talked about all the places she's been exploring and finding. And she she couldn't get over how few people were in the Fanard area when she 
the beaches she would be familiar with in her in her homeland, she said, would be small and overcrowded in the summertime. And yet she arrived up to the white shore and she walked it. She said, in this time, she'd be the only she one on it. She has two beautiful beaches there, as I walked them regularly. Mm. Uh, Rinmore and Ballyheeran Bay. The White mm-hmm. Shore is is uh, is Rinmore, yeah. and there's two mi- there's two miles of a walk there, and it's it's a vi- mainly, I must say, ninety nine percent empty. Mm-hmm. Uh, either the population is not there along the sea coast, or else people just don't walk. I think uh, people just. Uh, are not there. No, they're numbers, not there. Numbers, that's a big part. I think why Anna likes there, the place. To yeah, be honest, she yeah. she likes the solitude and all. But although she keeps, she does arrive, uh, brings her friends and family there, uh, and over the years too. So maybe and she's even said maybe in the future she might even get a small property there just to enjoy that solitude. So that's a nice feature we did with Anna Marcus from Germany. Very very good. I just happen to know the cottage which 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 she stays at, and it is, it is. Uh, oh, picturesque. It, it's a very remote. It's very picturesque, just underneath Marine Hill there. And you're you're looking at Loch Swilly across mm. down into Leenan. Mm. You're looking out towards the lighthouse, which you don't actually see from there. But then the Atlantic Ocean r- right across the Valley Waters creates a huge panorama of a landscape. Mm. So that's a nice story. And this was also a nice story back in the day, twenty years ago, because we do this feature in the Tribune every week. Uh, twenty years ago, we looked back, and one of the stories we featured this week, twenty years ago, was written by Kevin Sharkey of Highland Radio, now of BBC. Uh, also, BBC Northern Ireland. New, he's he's in the newsroom. Has been for a long, long time. But he was with Highland for many, many years, and he has the spy line IFF dilemma. Is there anyone out there? It's not so much a political crossroads as a watershed that confronts the thirty-year-old independent Fianna Fáil party over the weeks and months ahead, as it prepares to do battle in the next general election. And he goes on to say, of course, it's been said time and time again that over the last three decades that the party was entering its last chance saloon. But this time things are somewhat different on a variety of fronts, not least the fact that it's time for, for a changing of the guard and with it all the attendant political tribulations of who the new pretender should be. Because we all knew it was going to be Harry Blaine at that time, his late brother Neil <laughs> had just died mm. in, in 1995. Big changes. Fascinating. Uh, in like, you know, when you th- a lot of change in that time, John, eh? when you think back. He ends up his analysis. Is there, there appears to be no one else but Harry. In that instance, are the unspoken vibes from the party bigwigs, activists and councillors a silent code for the realisation that once again, it's Harry or bust. Uh, a nice take on that. Like Kevin, Kevin yeah. had a huge interest in politics and current affairs. And he has done very well for himself out of a, a career in journalism. Uh, not only in, before he went to Highland, but but afterwards also with BBC Northern Ireland, where he's probably seen several times a week. Yeah, yeah, you see regular. And we're going to look at then, we're going back to Dunfan, I believe it or not, even to your countryside. I uh, remember there. a new heritage trail mm-hmm. launched down there. Yeah, yeah, they launched it there at the weekend. It's a real uh, community effort, and uh, that's a way, I suppose, to kind of capitalise on the great history that they have in Dunfan. There's over 100 people attended uh, the launch at the weekend, which is nice to see a good crowd turn out. And I suppose they got it done as well before the, the bite of winter really hit as well. And uh, so there, the New Heritage Trail, which is going to be like a, a guided visitor walk around the Dunfanny, so can, they can discover how the, how the town r- grew. Just, just around the village? Yeah, that's, uh, the trail starts at the, at the workhouse, mm-hmm. which is historic, of course, in itself, built in the 1840s. Um, and then it takes in sort of 10 places of interest that is dotted around the village there. And uh, they have a whole range. And we know that there's uh, from the churches and to all the other uh, kind of areas of historical significance in the village. So it's a wee bit to tell tell you about everything there as well. So it capitalizes, I suppose, on their, the tours that they had made famous before with wee Hannah and all that in the, in, in the workhouse. So uh, Claire Corrin is the new manager in there and she seems to be very proactive indeed. I know there's a lot of good community support there. You can see it even in the photographs. So that's a nice oh, one yeah, that people big, can... Big spread. And on the front page you see another... It's, a, it's Ben McFadden actually from Creation yeah, leading a walk at Ars Friday on Monday. And that's a, it's, it's a very striking photograph. It's very atmospheric. Mm. and Captures but, that area very well. Don Fanny seems to have a lot of coverage in the paper this week because... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to another story from that area in just a little while because we want to visit Kirkkeel at this point. 
and look at uh, a cardiac defibrillator that has now been put in place at the old school, that's the community centre there in Kiri Keel. The brothers Kieran and Brian Gallagher have done more. They both celebrated my own birthday this year. And instead of getting birthday gifts or anything like that, they decided to give a gift to the community instead. So they end up having a new, having a new defibrillator installed there on last Thursday evening. And the money was raised, installed, and now it's up and running. And I, I presume, uh, I see it here. Members of the public came along. Certified trainer Fancy Market here gave a talk and a demonstration, and they outlined the importance of having defibrillators available in the community and how they could be used. A great gesture. A very big gesture, mm. and um, you know, we have we have lots of defibrillators around the areas now. Kirkiel already has defibrillators. At least there's one at the football field mm. that, I, that I know of. So they're building on that all the time. Yeah, it could be the saviour so of somebody. It could be the saviour of somebody, but you know, even if it never was, people are trained to use it. They know where it is, and sixty seconds can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see that from there. Now we're staying in Dunfinnie, as I said earlier on, and we're going to the soccer club and some emerging news there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was, I suppose, it was one that was highly anticipated now for quite some time, but after kind of a a, a long running uh, saga, really, the uh, Dunfinnie Youths Football Club were granted planning permission mm -hmm. for to develop a, a ground for themselves. That the club have been homeless effectively for now the best part of three years. Um, they played their games as most people would know as you just. The wee pitch they had was just on the way into Dunfanny had kill, but they were uh, there for the first over 20 years of their existence, but they served notice to quit, and then they uh, they had to move. Uh, the hunt was on for a new piece of ground. There were uh, a piece of ground located just over the bridge at Hornhead in Lord uh -huh. Um But at that time, that drew a certain amount of uh, controversy, I suppose, John, because there was a, a number... Lots of controversy. Lots of it. It became news, we've, both we've, sides of the... We've covered it numbers of times. Mm. But... That said, um, despite the, uh, the objections that came in at that time, the club eventually reissued a, a new plan and application to the council. Um, and that has now, after a lengthy process that I know and took a huge amount of effort on behalf of the club uh, between fundraising and all that, they uh, they were given the, the green light for the development uh, yeah, last but, Friday. You know, at a, at a more basic level, the, the teenage population of that area have been deprived of the right yeah. to play for play soccer locally mm -hmm. they've been coming across to places like Trialo where Fanon United is based Falcara Falcara Priestland and uh, the fact that this has rumbled on now for what several years yeah it's a, good it's, a, it's a very very slow process and they have to wait a, a, a prescribed period now before that uh, mm. is, 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 is finally agreed and the hope that it will be agreed fingers crossed yeah, hundred about one hundred and fifty young people there, and they're all all underage. They're all, they don't have yeah, a senior yeah. team, but I think that the big testament to them is that that they managed to keep that club afloat without a home ground for the best part of three years. Keep the young people training, playing, and engaged in sport. So um, I know it was broad. It was greatly welcomed across the area. Um, well, it is like it, it is one of one of the big planks in in, in community life, participation and mm. sport yeah. and all that kind of thing. And you'd hope now. That, that decision has been made that the entire community right. will ruin behind that right. and uh, put the shoulders to the wheel and ensure that that ground is developed and playable as a matter of urgency. Yeah, and the view that they have for that is that it's not exclusively uh, Dunfanny Youth, it's going to have a clubhouse, it's going to have a pitch, it's going to have all that ground. Yeah, it's going to have all and that. And they want to make that available to schools, community groups, and everything. So, you know, that's a worthy thing in itself. Um, to, to sort of assist with that uh, development and that could be something that could be uh, a real shining light in that area to... Uh, well, let's just keep an eye on that in the meantime. Mm, exactly so. We're going to look then, there's a couple of stories featuring around the front page. The oncology clinic closed for the second week and this is Deputy Pierre Starr. He has called for contingency measures to be activated after he discovered that the oncology clinic at Letterkenny University Hospital was closed for the second week. Having spoken to some of the families, he says he understands that this was not a sudden issue, hmm. probably related to staffing, and it had been flagged in advance. Now, of all clinics, the oncology clinic would be a vital one, and we just hope that they can get that up and running as quickly as possible again. 
but obviously the hospital is very very overstretched and staffing it's all right for us sitting here saying this shouldn't happen it's going to happen and it will keep happening because the hospital has been so stretched uh, with covid particularly and uh, staffing is going to be a huge issue in, in, in every hospital it's going, it's going to be the it's going to be the major headline right right across the whole winter season but, uh, it's, good, but it's, it's going to staffing is an issue for everything you know, but from hospital, you know, like I mean, it's yeah, like it, it, it's a and huge it's a specialized issue. Job, this right? is a, this is a different issue here. The day centre, mm. at St Connells, we have featured the this day centre. Uh, it's, it's been closed, rumbling on a long time. It's right? Closed for five hundred and ninety-five days. Now, numbers of politicians, Jerry McMonagle, Patrick McLaughlin, Keir and Brogan, have been raising this, but as of today, we are no wiser than we were a year ago. It was understandable that all these facilities would have shut down uh, a year last March when COVID first struck. But there are many, many people who are actually very, very dependent on using those day centres. Mm. I mean, they are the they are the the link that uh, that they uh, that they look to for their own well being mm. every week. Yeah. There'll be one day a week or two days a week or three days a week that they make their way in there. Uh, Maybe the routine and all. Communication, the routine. Uh, there's the whole issue about medication. There's the whole issue about food and clothing and all of this kind of thing. But it's also the wider issue, just the participation of being amongst uh, a group of people that they're familiar with mm. and that and that they look forward to doing the various jobs that they do around that and occupational therapy or whatever else to do. Yeah. Uh, to think that it's still open after 595 days beggars belief and it, Jerry McMonigle is just saying there that despite repeated requests for an update on the reopening of the service for its 50 users he has received nothing but substandard answers which he described as an appalling situation for all the families concerned now I could easily empathise with that because we had main issues raised last year about that in relation to one particular individual mm. uh, we never did get any satisfactory answers and that's sad to say seems to be what the politicians are 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 getting as well and jerry keeps she just she keeps on this one and he says at no time have i been told officially that the day center is reopening at st connell's and i've asked the question plenty of times so like it's time to come clean here and let the families know what the situation is regarding the day center now that story probably will crop up again because I don't think that's the end of it. But we're going to go back, take a quick look at our lead story. Angry farmers confront cap and carbon cuts. And this has been this has been batting away in the wind here for weeks on end now, but in the past week it has flared up quite a bit. Uh, in the south of the country and indeed this week in in Longford and in in, in Cavan where Charlie McConnell was confronted with lots of protesters, a uh, very angry farmers, and very upset about about the. There's two big issues there, of course, cap the new cap deal, uh, and and the the whole issue around carbon cuts, where there's going to be somewhere between twenty one and thirty percent be, between now and twenty thirty. Mm. Uh, farmers are very much at the forefront of of this development. And they would be forced very, very strongly to fight every, every, every step of the way to stay in business. And mm. like that's the basic fact. It, the the cap deal is very different. It's a totally different thing. It's no longer about production. It's about preservation and conservation and all of those kind of things. But the reality is, there just simply is not enough money there. You're simply taken from one farm or one group of farms to give to another. And the sucker herd, according to all the farm lobbies. Have been very very severely hit whilst organic farm and uh, farming has been very heavily promoted yeah yeah and there's a whole lot of if you aren't you could spend the whole day going into all the different anomalies that's going on here but uh, as minister for uh, agriculture charlie mcconnell has two big battles on his hands there to convince the farming lobbies and to try and sell that deal to them you know uh, if he doesn't do that then where does he go does he go back to brussels and try and get a better deal those are the, he is from now until Christmas time to get that sorted out and the omens are not good I would have to say but for us the omens are at this point where it's time to say goodbye for this week Happy Halloween, we'll talk to you again next Wednesday